Good morning, everyone. As Allison said, I'm Melissa Messina, and I had the honor to work with the incredible team at Virginia Mocha and Maya Lynn Studio to curate this exhibition. And now I have the privilege of introducing Maya. Artist and designer Maya Lynn interprets the, national, the natural world through history, politics, and culture, creating works that balance art and architecture. Lynn's sculptural installations, studio artworks, architecture, and memorials, such as the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, merge physical and psychological environments and offer a new way of, us, of seeing the world around us. Among the most acclaimed artists of our time, Lynn was awarded the National Medal of Arts, the nation's highest honor for artistic excellence in 2009, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2016, the Ken Burns American Heritage Prize in 2018, among others. Her art has been presented in public spaces and in major cultural institutions worldwide. A committed environmentalist, she continues what she considers her final memorial, a cross-platform global memorial to the planet entitled What is Missing that began in 2009. We are grateful for its inclusion as part of a study of water, as well as the installation Marble Chesapeake and Delaware Bay, as two expanded site responsive works that call attention to the ecological concerns of this region. It has been particularly rewarding to bring Lynn's art, which explores how we experience landscape in relation to history, memory, time, and language, to a place open to creating dialogue around these issues through art. As Lynn's work invites awe, and wonder. The distinction between these two emotions was recently brought to my attention. Awe is a feeling of reverential respect. Wonder is a feeling that invites curiosity to know something. And I think it's especially important to consider, as with her work, the first inspires and the second calls us to action. With further ado, with no further ado, Myelin. I'm just going to get started, so if we're going to go to a dark hall, you can all take a nap. Um, there we go. So a study of water, which um, you'll visit after the talk, is um, it made me realize as I was pulling it together, some older works, some much newer works made for the show, that I have been pretty much preoccupied with and obsessed with water for at least 30 years, and I don't quite know why, but I have actually done works that have dealt with all three states of water, um, solid, liquid, and vapor in many of my artworks, and I think maybe it's because I see my life as like a tripod between the art, the architecture, and the memorials, and maybe there's something that just drew me to water. It's also, I'm a very committed and caring environmentalist, and water is the lifeblood of our planet and of us. So without further ado, I'm just gonna talk about um, some artworks and then go into what is missing. And this was a piece that I installed at the Venice Biennale, so maybe it was 2020, not 2020, 19, 2019, called Water, Water Everywhere and Not a Drop to Drink. And it was part of a group show Fong Bui had done, and um, you can sort of see the title in bright red neon, Artists Need to Create on the Same Scale that Society Has the Capacity to Destroy. And I wanted to create, um, since Venice is sinking. I just wanted to make a piece that was about the preciousness and beauty of water, but also its rarity and fragility. That being said, the Chesapeake Bay, which is why I'm so excited to be here, has played a very large part in many of my, what I would call the museum studio sculptures. And people have asked, I think in the last few days, well, why the Chesapeake, one? From an ecological point of view, it is one of the most critically important waterways in this country. Two, it is so beautiful as a form. And so sometimes I'm drawn to water because of the ecological importance, and other times because they make such a beautiful drawing. And I had a show at the Hudson River Museum, which was all about the Hudson River, and it was a river is a drawing. And so it's just been, again, very much a part of my work. I think I cast the first one of these um, in 2008, and I've been working with the different riffs of it, which I will go into. But I've also done a really large part of my work is very large outdoor installations, and yet again, involved with water. So this is a naturally occurring repetitive wave called a Stokes wave. 
And I came across this when I was uh, researching my first, what would become my first uh, of the earthworks. My father's a ceramicist, and I played in his studio as a child. And so I'm still playing in my studio now with a plasticine, which is an oil-based clay. So these are all different iterations of water waves. And I couldn't figure out how does a wave begin and how does it end? And at some point, you just have to go out there with a leap of faith and start carving it into the landscape. So this was for the University of Michigan. It's 10,000 square feet. It's 100 foot by 100 feet. And um, I started understanding how does a wave begin and end as a, if you stopped motion and caught a wave. And it became the first of the wave fields, which I put in in their aerospace engineering building in um, 1993. And um, at that point, I had interviewed all the scientists in aerospace engineering. And um, in the end, I found that one image of that recurring water wave. And at that point, the head of the department said, yeah, but doesn't this belong over in naval engineering? And so at this point, if I talk to scientists, I'm like, well, I'm going to go fishing for a lot of information because I am site specific, but my site isn't just a physical site. It's what's going on culturally, what's going on, and knowing that they were learning all about fluid dynamics um, led me to this piece. It did lead to further iterations. Um, I do work in series, and even though I range form a lot out of series, I love to study an idea and then take it to scale, experiment with scale, experiment with form. So from this wave, which again, from different angles in the classrooms changed completely, almost like an Escher painting, I went to what would be the second of the wave field series, which was based not so much on a water wave, but what water does to the sand underneath it. It's called flutter. And it's a very shallow wave pattern, which worked perfectly for um, GSA, Federal Courthouse, Miami, because they were really concerned about people hiding or maybe snipers. So we ended up with a wave that worked for them, it worked for me, but it was kind of, I thought, really, you're, you can't go above two feet. So that's, um, it's called Flutter, and those are just images of it. And with this one, um, we used uh, Florida crabgrass, because again, I try to do something that is native species, hardy, and once we get it started, we'll need, need much less watering and maintenance and care. The third in the series I did for Storm King, and as you can see in this drawing, um, those red line marks, which are cut topo lines, I fell in love with a former abandoned gravel pit. So a lot of the sites I choose are reclaimed sites, degraded sites, overlooked sites. So this one was at the edge of where all the artworks were, the Andy Goldsworthy piece was right on to the right of the red lines, and they hid this site under a very large earth berm, capped it temporarily with the state EPA, and just left it alone. So I proposed building the entire artwork out of the berm that was used to hide this unsightly little pit, and in the end, that's what we did. That's that berm, and this is sort of drawings of it. It's called the Storm King Wavefield. And I was probably on site every other day working with the crew to sculpt these mounds. And so with this one, I go from the first wave at Michigan was three to five feet. The scale is human. You curl up in a wave and read a book. Uh, second wave, very shallow. Third wave, well, what if you could get lost in a wave? Sort of like we've all heard about it when you're at sea and the waves are 60 feet high. And I just wanted you to feel like you would almost get lost in each wave as you went into it. The waves are about 18 feet high. And they had to fit in and have a dialogue with the adjacent hills. And that's sort of how it sits today. But as I've been building these large outdoor work, I've been also bringing that aesthetic inside. And sometimes I think that what I make in my studio with my team leads to and is the genesis seed for what I then take outside. Because when you're working at the scale of four acres, 11 acres, you're working with bulldozers. And so everything you really want to control and make and study is in your studio with smaller scaled work. So this wave was untitled topographic landscape. It went into a show 
um, called Topologies at Sika, and it traveled, and it was almost like an infinite landscape, um, all formaldehyde-free um, MDF board. And it did lead me to a question. Well, what if I could bring a hill inside? This is a blueprint. I think there's like 50,000 two by fours, each little rectangle called out. And it became two by four landscape. It's 3,000 square feet, it goes 18 feet high. And it actually can't make up its mind if it's a hill or a cresting wave. And this was a show that was um, sponsored by the Henry Art Museum in Seattle, Washington, the Henry Art Gallery. And um, it traveled, it took a while to travel it. I think it took almost two months for us to install this show because there were three large pieces. But that's sort of the genesis. And I love the ambiguity. Well, from the front, it looks like a cresting wave. From the back, it felt like a hill. Led me to further explorations, both large scale and small, in wave formations. So the piece that you'll see here is called Flow. It was first done for Storm King as I opened the Storm King wave field, which led me again to, oops, I don't know how to get this to work, okay, to a sinusoidal wave formation, which has led me to one of my largest pieces for the Gibbs Estate in New Zealand, where I worked in a really degraded pasture land that was draining terribly. So I ended up fixing the drainage and creating a piece um, that kind of is mowed partly by sheep. And that's sort of the piece. Some sheep, I actually have one where the whole site is covered by sheep, but I don't know where that one is. And these waves, it's called a fold in the field. And each fold is about 60 feet high. As well, my love of water has taken me to actually understand topographic terrain. We're a funny creature, we're very visual, so if we don't see it, do we really think it exists? If someone's downstream from you, are you really worried about it? And maybe you're worried if someone lives upstream from you is polluting. We tend to know the point in the river we're at, which again, one of the reasons I focus on whole waterways is to get you to see it as an organic, complex, completely connected ecosystem. But this is sort of how a computer sees topography. And that became a series of wire drawings called Waterline. This one is, um, again, for the show, topography. The only top two feet is the island of Bouvet. The rest of it is the terrain below the ocean in the southernmost part of the Atlantic. And again, it led me to one of my first, first permanent wire landscapes, which is for the San Francisco Cal California Academy of Sciences. And we mapped the entire San Francisco Bay at the mouth of the bay. And at this point, you can actually eat your lunch sitting under Angel Island. So my fascination with water level, sea level, this is the tallest mountain in the world. Can we guess what it is? Hawaii. So again, we tend to see land and water as completely separate. And it took me longer, say, for the San Francisco Bay to take the terrain above sea level and the terrain below sea level and get them to mesh because we simply separate them with, of course, with climate change, sea level is permutable and changing. What isn't is the landscape itself below. So I always love showing this one because, again, Hawaii, beats Everest by about a mile. And those cut topographies, I work with Mac Mayberg's, led to a couple pieces that really revealed topography above and below sea level. This one is called Around the World Times Three, and it marks the equator, the 44th parallel, and then the, arc, the North Pole. And that was for a show at the Parish Art Museum. And just to give you an idea, you know, you can see where people crossed over. This is a terrain of the Arctic Circle where in the lowest portion you could walk over in the Bering Strait land bridge. And so it became an Arctic and Antarctic circle. As well, I'm fascinated now by the massive changes that are going to happen in the North Pole. So these are all the rivers that flow into the North Pole and it became a drawing, a Pin River drawing. 
which is also in, in the exhibit here. And you can sort of see how the pins just come together. But I kind of love sometimes using pins, not silver, because you can really talk about the diffusion of water. And I have been finding a lot of my time being focused much more on climate change. So this is a New York Times drawing of the floodplain of Hurricane Sandy, which again was almost a moment in time. Maybe it lasted six hours. We all know about it, but it is a beautiful drawing form that shows how hard this, the impact on the shore was. And it became a Pin River drawing of Hurricane Sandy's. And again, obsessed with how quickly we are losing the ice and the glaciers in both the Arctic and Antarctic. And it's led to a series of works of which um, are kind of white encaustic, but not just showing sea area loss, but what the science really are trying to say, scientists are saying is, it's the thickness. And the thickness is disappearing. So the thin layers of ice are all about getting people to understand that the, the vulnerability of ice when you've carved out from underneath. So it's going to melt a lot quicker now because it's so much thinner than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So it led to an Arctic and Antarctic um, encaustic white on white relief sculptures dealing with the layers the diminishing layers, so the uppermost level is where we're at today, and then the thinness, of course, expresses the vulnerability due to the fact that we're eating away, the water's eating away at these ice areas from beneath. Which led me to another work that's in the show, which is the receding of the Laurentide um, ice the, during the glaciation, and it literally creates most of a lot of the landscape in North and South America, especially um, how it gouges through and creates the lakes. So first there's a piece in the show called Under the Laurentide, which really shows the diminishment of, of the glaciers. Here it is, the other one was the Antarctic actually. So this shows how the, the glacier receded, the Laurentide, and also the Finger Lakes, which are almost like how the moraine scraped through and created these Finger Lakes, so those two are almost a pair, and the Finger Lakes are, are carved into, or appear to be carved into the wall itself. And it led me to another work that's um, more recent in the show, which, called, which is called The Traces Left Behind, which is cast in recycled silver, and goes from Canada to the Great Lakes and traces the flow of water the fresh water that has been left over from literally that gouging of, of, of the territory of the land. And that also is a piece that's included in the show. And that, of course, is the Great Lakes region. So we sort of think of the Great Lakes. Um, what I love about this is you can kind of see, whoop, bottom, you've got Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, and that tiny little connector between the two is Niagara Falls. So again, can we get you to see a major body of water as a singularity, as a whole, as an interconnected ecosystem? And those are just my little puddles of that piece. Sometimes, though, I'm drawn to a river because I f was flying in to see the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas, and the upper White River was reflecting like silver. One of the reasons I chose silver is that the early Europeans, when they first saw the abundance of fish in the rivers, it was called running silver because the water reflected off the silvery, uh, silver of the backs, probably of the Minhaden, of the Shad, and so they termed it running silver. So I've always loved using recycled silver and the silvery pins for the depiction of water. This just, as I was flying in, um, the, the, the light was just reflecting off of this, what almost looks like an insect. I love the Chesapeake partly because it reminds me of a ginger root. Um, so that became the, um, the White River for the Crystal Bridges Museum. And again, it just 
it, it's like, is it a tree root? Is it, is it like a centipede? I just fell in love with the form, which I do. Other times I, I choose rivers because they are so important, ecologically so important to us. Or for me, of course, the Hudson River is my home. So seeing a river as a figure ground where you're seeing not the land, but the water becomes very much a part of these. So you can kind of see in the bottom close up, Staten Island, Manhattan, but you're really again seeing how the waterways come together. Or another piece for the Hudson River Museum showed the entire watershed of the Hudson River in pins as it entered out into the bay. And then here we are at the Chesapeake. Oh, that's part of the Hudson. Sorry, I popped around. But we'll go back to the, the Chesapeake, which I think is one of the most intriguing and beautiful um, water systems I've, I've worked with. And after that silver piece, I did a piece for the Renwick, which I kind of put in here. Very different experience, because at the Renwick, it was contained within a very tight room. Here, it was allowed to flow, and there's a lot of space to experience it. But it's called Folding the Chesapeake. And it's made out of industrial glass marbles. So you can tell me, um, you'll experience a very different level of the piece outside. But I do like to ground you with what is right outside your front door or under your feet in the natural world. So in that sense, I'm trying to connect you to the nature right outside of your front door. This was done for the New Orleans Museum of Art, the Mississippi River, for a permanent work in their new pavilion in their garden. And it too is out of industrial marbles. And I, just the way the light catches it, again, I'm trying to capture in the mediums, sort of a reflectivity, which is so much a part of water. And so when the sun hits it at certain times of day, it almost, it's like a light switch went on. Or this piece, I was asked to be in a group show with um, Ann Hamilton and Jenny Holzer for the Wexner Center. It's called Here. And I gave them two large scale artworks and mine dealt with watershed and flooding as the Ohio hits the Mississippi. This is the, a few years ago, there was those massive spring floods. So this first piece is called, How Does a River Overflow Its Banks? And this is the floodplain of the Ohio as it is about to enter the Mississippi. And that's just one of my drawings of it. So it starts every river, tributaries, the river itself on the walls, and then at some point, there is so much rain coming in that the water breaks the bank. So at that moment, I turn, the marbles turned from the ceiling and the walls to the floor, and all of a sudden it became a negation. So the river becomes a negative, and the floodplain becomes a positive. So that's how this show looked. And the break, so all of a sudden you see the massive flooding that is going on, again, partly because of climate change a lot because of climate change. That, along with an entrance piece, was about the aquifers that go completely throughout, throughout Ohio. I am um, from the state of Ohio, so I really wanted to point out the fact that it's coal country there, which means there's a lot of natural grass and fracking. And if you do not frack carefully, what are we doing to our watersheds? So these are all the fracking wells that are being tracked. And notice where they are in relation to the watershed. So we made a draw I made a drawing. And that's sort of how that drawing looks. Now I'm going to show you images of a piece that has nothing to do with water. I'm not going to talk. It's ghost for us. It's a piece I installed last year. Just to give you an idea of something that isn't really, a, it is about water and that salt water and inundation killed off the Atlantic cedars that I used for the piece. But just to give you an idea of something that I did process wise. So um, I spend a lot of my time, I set up a foundation called What is Missing. This is 
in a way part of that as well, where we raise awareness about what we're losing in terms of biodiversity, link it integrally to habitat loss, and basically emphasize that protecting and restoring habitats will both reduce emissions significantly and also bring back biodiversity, and also make our agriculture, our food processes, much more resilient to climate change. So when I put this piece in, which was all about the loss, um, they're called ghost forests, they're happening because of drought, forest fires, saltwater inundation, I also believed we had to show you what you can do. And my emphasis is always on nature-based solutions to climate change. So I, I, the whole artwork included the planting of a thousand trees and shrubs through the Natural Areas Conservancy. And um, we calculated that uh, it took us 5.3 tons of carbon to make that piece over the four years that it took us to figure it out and build it. And um, the Conservancy calculated that over 10 years, those 10,000 trees and shrubs will absorb 60 tons of carbon. So we sort of offset. And we might, the public art, the programming emphasized lectures on nature-based solutions to climate change because I think Time is running out, but I do believe restoring our wetlands, our agriculture, farming, ranching, um, can make a huge difference and also protect biodiversity. So this is sort of an intro to what is missing, which um, I started in 2005. I actually launched an idea of it in 1999 in my first book, Boundaries. Uh, I had worked on four other memorials, um, Vietnam, Civil Rights, The Women's Table, The Confluence Project, which is uh, dealing with Native American tribes along the Lewis and Clark Trail. and. I wanted, I started collecting clippings on biodiversity loss. I've, since I was a child, cared deeply about the environment. So I wanted to call one memorial into being. And so it became what is missing. It started as the Extinction Project. But by the time I did my art, the artwork, the wire landscape for the California Academy of Sciences, I realized um, I needed to deal with what we're losing, especially stuff you don't even realize is disappearing. So it's not the species that are already gone, because obviously what we want to be doing is to understand the ones we will lose if we do not take action. So that's sort of how it started. It has been a guerrilla art project. Um, 
promised the scientists at the California Academy of Sciences I wouldn't just focus on loss, that it would be equally balanced with what we can do to help. So it's just a wake-up call and a call to action. And I asked the question, well, what if I could make a memorial jump form? What if it's like water? It will flow wherever it's invited in. It's free as long as you share it. And so it, it's sort of a permutable work. First permanent installation is RCA Victor, our master's voice. It's a listening cone. And uh, Nat Geo donated film, the BBC donated film, Cornell Anthology donated film and science, sound. And kids love to sit inside and listen. We've created about 75 one to two minute almost haiku-like videos about what we're losing. Because we started with what we're losing, but I always knew this piece, like all my memorials, would deal with time. It would work with the planet, past, present, and future. And I'll go into that in a second. But this was the listening cone. This is one of my favorites. It's called The Empty Room. You get to pick up an optic piece of plexi and catch the animal or place and learn about it. The text is quoted from all the environmental groups, science institutions, because I wanted you to see them as a family, as a whole, and chart the work that they're doing. Again, how can I maybe get you to connect to nature in a different way? You hear the animal before you see it. Again, stopping that visual connection first. You're denying the animal. So you, again, we are very visual. And we tend to like, pay attention more and like, stop that first and let the sounds envelop you. Uh, Creative Time got us the MTV billboard for the month of April one year. It's a volunteer project for me, so I kind of come out with new iterations every Earth Day. Uh, Philip Wim asked me to do his 10th anniversary collection, and I said, mm, not really my speed, but if you help missing out and we could focus something on organic soil, let's do something. So they used their whole social media network, and we ended up doing with 200 tons of actual compost. A little art installation. It took me a day to do the two days. James, I think you were part of it. Um, it was insane. And then this is what happened. <laughs> I, you know, it's like my girls sort of had a laugh out of this. I don't really, fashion isn't my thing. But um, anyway, my deal with him was he would donate money to Missing. But on top of that, he got his entire team to go out into parks in and around the city and repurpose all the compost, as well as we used his social media outlet to send out what is missing information, what is missing soil. Since 1960, one third of the world's arable land has been lost through erosion. And again, here comes the emphasis, regenerative, no-till, organic agriculture. Huge boon. And then I, I partnered with the Perfect Earth Group to ask a quick question. What is the largest crop grown in America? You got it. The American lawn. And these are the pesticides that you're exposing your pets and your kids and you to. But you might not know this. So what, what I try to do with missing is have a little bit of a sense of humor about this. Um, did you know more gasoline is spilled refilling lawn equipment than was spilled at the Exxon Valdez? We just have to put this in perspective, guys. Um, but also, that's 50% of your land, so you could give 50% of your land back to nature and links to groups so you can invite nature in. And then Perfect Earth Project, which ha now has become two-thirds for the bird, tells you how you can make your lawn toxin-free and habitat-friendly. So the only thing we ask of you is give us a memory. I'll get into that later. But then we try to focus on the groups in each area that we're highlighting. Another piece I did for Storm King is called The Secret Life of Grasses, emphasizing that the root structure of prairie grasses can be 18, 12 to 18 feet, and that's where the soil is really becoming a very healthy, very complex carbon sink. So we worked with the Land Institute, who have developed a perennial wheat called Kernza, because every time you till up the soil every year, 
and have to replant your releasing carbon and you're actually promoting erosion within the landscape. So that's that piece, which was built for Storm King a few years ago. Because that is, did you know, prairies can store more carbon underground than forests can store in their trees above ground. So that root structure is unbelievable. So we wanted to kind of emphasize that. And then, of course, go, with ghost forests, which we linked to what is missing and created a soundscape of animal sounds of animals that used to roam through Manhattan, from bears to wolves. And then again, the offset and the collaboration with the Natural Areas Conservancy. So soil and the life of that soil, what's right under your feet, is very much a part of this project. But what we're really trying to emphasize is that the main drivers of climate change and the main drivers of species loss account for 50% almost of all emissions. So if we can focus, what is missing focuses on that middle section, which is all about land degradation and loss. And if you add up, you know, if you take Nature Conservancy, Project Drawdown, the Climate Foundation, that restoring our forests, farms, croplands, pasture wetlands, that could be 45 to 90 percent of annual emissions offset. It's huge. And what if we could give that land back to nature? So if you go to the website, it is still a work in progress. Uh, this gorilla artwork has grown iteratively. Bad idea for an artwork, but I had to do it this way. So the website has seen many, many different forms. And then we had a little bit of a kerfuffle in um, December. We were almost revamping it, and then we lost the web designer, so we are revamping. It's not there yet, but have patience with it. Go to it. Explore a history of the world. There's thousands of ecological histories, personal memories. Add a memory. But we also wanted to deal with solutions. So this was the old site, and you can sort of see there, it's like a video game. You don't quite know how to use it. So instead, we've now got this, if it'll play. Uh-oh, let's see if it plays. So now it's very simple. On the left-hand bottom, you can explore stories of the world. And on the right, we're emphasizing solutions. So it's a little bit easier. It's still hard to navigate. Give me till September, it'll be better. But there are, again, thousands of stories. And there are in-depth timelines, of which, in the show, the Chesapeake Bay timeline, there's over 100 entries, charts an ecological history of your bay. And you can view these the world as in a globe form, in a flat map form, and also as a timeline. As an artist, though, I'm always trying to get you to think of something that you might not be thinking of. So I was stunned that when I found out that songbirds, common songbirds when I was a child, are in a 50 to 90% decline. So literally the soundscape we all grew up with has changed drastically. So you have to ask yourself, you know, how can we protect it if we don't even realize it's disappearing? It's called shifting baselines. And you probably know what you know about the Atlantic cod, and it was this big. Whereas what you didn't know is it was bigger than you in the 1890s. And there are all these stories. So what our ecological histories try to, try to do is get you to understand massive abundance, what's missing, not to depress you, but almost leave you in awe of what nature can hold. And then those timelines, you know, the minute we realize po what pollution is doing, many of our rivers enact legislation. Nature's resilient, and if you give it a chance, it comes back. And so there's a whole echo throughout the timelines of that arc, where the minute we start protecting it, we've all seen it, a, a plant, a tree growing horizontally out of a cliff face. Nature is incredibly strong. We're just not giving it a chance to come back. So I'm just fascinated. This one I told to a, a fisheries expert, and I said, Adrian Vanderdonk, you know, lobsters were six feet long. And he said, oh, Maya, Adrian exaggerated. Lobsters were only five feet long. <laughs> so um, 
And these are those timelines. Again, I apologize, the website, we kind of got left in the lurch in December, so it's actually harder to find the timelines. We're bringing that back, but be patient with it. By September, it should be up and running. But the timelines are hugely important to us because they really do show the, the abundance at the start, the horrible loss, and then the, the need to protect, legislate, conserve, and then the Thames is the cleanest it's been in 400 years. Oysters are coming back to the Chesapeake Bay. Oysters are coming back, seals to New York Harbor. So of course, uh, just, just to give you an idea, what I just learned this uh, like about four days ago. I had no idea that the Chesapeake Bay is formed more from not so much the Laurentide glaciation, but from this massive meteor that hit this area 36 million years ago and created this intense, um, backwash up in, so that I just had to put in. But oops, these are just more. We kind of bring you through, get you to s place yourself in the time of um, what Native American tribes have been here before and acknowledge that. And then notations from the first European settlers of how abundant these areas were and then what begins to happen, of course. So we would love memories of the Chesapeake Bay area. We actually don't have many. I would love everyone to go and hand write it down in the show or add it to share a memory on our website. If you have a, fam a photo, if you can remember something your grandparents told you or parents, we're literally trying to touch back to that idea of shifting baselines. How can we even realize something's gone because we know what we know at our point upon a river and our time upon the river. So if we can reach back in time, I think we can really help people understand how amazingly wonderful these areas are and can be again. So things are coming back. We just went out to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and looked at oyster restoration. Oysters play a big part. So loss is a very important part, but the memories are just so heartfelt to me. So this, someone entered this, this is Narragansett Bay, we're at like black tie dinner out on the ice, can't do that anymore. Um, wonderful memories, so please, please help us out. And so that is sort of what we're losing in the past and connecting you, making you feel like care enough to wanna do something and then comes solution. So on the right-hand side, what we've got going right now, it will keep going. It's called Mapping the Future, where we go through agriculture, forest land, aquaculture, and we get to map and show what you could do and how important it will be to not just reduce emissions, but to give land back to nature. So that link is always there. And I do believe science fiction, art, like we imagined it first and then we got to the moon, we made the escalator, the elevator. So I think if I can roadmap possible, plausible solutions, and I'll show you some of the things we do through missing. So web-based mass mapping project, forest protection, regenerative agricultural, sustainable grazing, wetland protection, uh, increasing protection of, and conservation of land, sustainable practices, energy, transportation waste and sprawling up. So it's called green print or mapping the future. It looks at how we live, where we live, what we spend our money on. So I do a whole section, this is where the artist in me comes out, maybe to get you to think about the problem slightly differently. Play with scale. So what if we all lived at the population density of Manhattan? How much space would 7.6 billion of us take up? Anyone know the answer? Someone shout it out. State of Arizona. So the next time someone tells you, oh, there are too many people in the world, I don't think it's just about that. I think it's land use and resource consumption. And I think the top 1.3 billion of us are doing the damage. Um, 
So again, we try to rearrange the lights in mapping the future. But we also love getting you to think about the problem slightly differently. So according to the World Economic Forum, it would take 1.6 trillion annually to curb climate change. It sounds like, oh my god, that's way too much money. But then think of some of the other things we spend every year. And what we're basically doing is spending our kids' futures. So again, maybe with the sense of humor, follow the money, we like, oh, have another drink, but actually don't have that other drink, spend it on the environment, 1.5 trillion. Tobacco worldwide, drug trafficking meetings in the US, or I love it, gambling worldwide, cell phone, bottled waters, gasoline. It's just, this is what we're doing, and we're doing it every year. And you know how bad it is out there and how bad it will be. So again, trying to put it in perspective, Maybe 1.6 trillion isn't that much money, and we could turn this around. Love this one, and if you go over to protecting all biological diversity, um, it kind of is equivalent to what we spend on chocolate worldwide. And so just take a look through, I'm not gonna read through it, but I just find the fact that, it, what would it take, according to Lester Brown, to stabilize all water tables? and Ironically, that's sort of what we spend on bottled water in the US. So again, this is all and will be more easy to find on the website in September. It is there, it's under green print. I am, it's really hard right now still, but it will get there. And this one I love because again, agriculture around the Chesapeake Bay is a huge part of it. And a lot of it is because we think it's intractable under these massive subsidies. So what if we subsidize good practices rather than bad? you still get the same amount of money, but you could convert so that we could actually protect our soils, protect ourselves. And so these are just some of the things we subsidize and maybe we could just rethink those subsidies a little. Or this one, I've always wanted to consider this. If we spend two trillion on defense, couldn't we consider part of that being defending the planet? Cannot resist comparing how much we spend on space exploration as in we've messed up this planet, we will go elsewhere, compared to what we are not spending on what we need to be spending on, because this is our only home. We really don't really want to live on Mars. Um, and then this is the price if we do nothing. So we do focus as well on energy efficiency. We take best practices around the world, which would, again, if we enabled what's already being done and scale it up, it's almost 50% of all emissions. Cities are a huge issue with that since we use 70% of our energy. So we ask questions like that. But for the most part, we like to emphasize going back to protecting nature and how it can benefit both um, biodiversity and reduce emissions, so it's called save two birds with one tree, and if you protect a wetland, you save three birds because you also protect yourself from rising seas. But just to give you an idea of scale, this is how much area it would take, the little dots for offshore oil, offshore wind and solar, which, I don't know, I have this thing against every field I see covered in solar panels when instead the amount of area it would take to offset the U.S. electricity needs with solar panels is ironically equivalent to our area in parking lots. So why aren't we putting more of our solar panels on the built environment and leaving our fields as fields? So we do have a whole list of what you can do, what you can buy, and we again try to get you to think of it differently. So um, just comparing the US to the European, to the Chinese, to the Middle East, what are, what we, what's in our shopping bag? How big is our home? How much water do we use? So you can kind of tell per capita, um, we kind of need to rethink what we're doing. Diet is a big one. But I don't say don't eat meat. I just say, whoa, what if you ate 20% less? That would free up enough land, equivalent to all the protected land in North America, and half the protected land in South America. And oh, it's almost Easter, so I can't resist. We always send this out. So anyone have an answer to um, why, what do a rabbit in the Mississippi River have in common? Um, 
we'd save enough water equivalent to what flows over the entire Mississippi. And if we all substituted rabbit for beef, this is how much land we would save up. And again, I'm, I'm glad you're all laughing because again, for me, it was always about, can we just think differently about this? Can we just put it in a perspective that kind of says, this is fixable, this is doable. We could all do something. We could make a difference here. So we couldn't resist, like, this is like the carbon footprint of eating different types of meat. Couldn't figure out how a lamb has such a big footprint. I still don't believe that, but there it is. Um, so you can kind of tell there's the rabbit. It is very cute, but um, kind of brings you to your logical conclusion of the bugs. But if you don't like eating bugs, um, there are, of course, those lentils. We love those lentils. But we do things like this. So couldn't resist, um, because what do we do? We feed our we feed our uh, chicken to fish, and we feed our fish to our chicken. And as one scientist said, our fish are beginning to taste like chicken, and our chicken are beginning to taste like fig, fish. And yes, you know, half the 30% of the world eats bug protein. I'm not crazy about it, but what do you think free-range chickens and freshwater fish, why do you think they call it fly fishing? So again, just put it in perspective, think differently, and again, eat lower down the food chain. So those shellfish, those oysters, hugely important. Just a few things, coffee. The difference between traditional ver plantation versus shade ground is almost three to four times the number of species you can help. Sugar cause greater loss of biodiversity on the planet than any other crop. So eat organic or switch to agave and honey. These are all things we all do or we could do. And then we take you to the area it's grown and we will be putting in animals at risk in those areas. I'll just go through these a little because I want to get through this because going along. So I will just end with Nature-based solutions, 45 to 90 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions, you know, silvopastoral, regenerative agriculture, uh, sustainable forestry practices. And I just want to end with wetlands because here we are. Blue carbon habitats may stand alone as the most efficient biological reservoirs of stored carbon. So you are here and the Chesapeake Bay becomes a huge solution to climate change. If we rethink our farming, rethink the soils, rethink protection of the wetlands, because wetlands sequester three times as much carbon as a tropical forest. And I'm going to kind of end with one thing. Oh, yeah, and don't build a wall, build a dune, restore your wetlands, um, more job creation and much better for the environment, and getting back to those oysters. And again, we had a the great pleasure of touring the Chesapeake Bay Foundation because around here those oyster reefs could have significant protection for our coastal lands. This is what the Billion Oyster Project is doing in New York area and this is what you guys are doing down here. So um, there you go. These are huge boons for both climate change mitigation and um, storm surge and as well as cleaning the bay and bringing back biodiversity. So I'll end with one thing.
that was produced for COP15 in support of RED, um, and it was done. You can tell it's not what is missing.net, it's what is missing.org. But uh, again, we can turn the lights up, or some of the lights. And um, if you have a personal memory, please share it with the website, whatismissing.org. And uh, yeah, uh, if we have any questions, that's sort of it.